Hey everyone, I'm my user Mike. I tend to walk around. Um, uh, this is my great colleague and former PhD student, now Dr. Aguilar Hernandez. Um, we are going to present today our research. We undertook a really long project, a four-year project with an emergency services uh, police and first responder organisation or jurisdiction rather in Australia, just confirming that it wasn't Western Australia. Um, we do work with a particularly Western Australia police force, but uh, this, this is not Western Australian based. In saying that, my last name, is not, but but my heritage and my nose is Italian, and I have I have an issue keeping secrets. So if I do get too candid at uh, any point, just consider this uh, Chatham House rules, and and um, we're all friends. Keep it keep it there. Um, I'm really proud about this because this might seem strange. My formal training is in music, um, but I read prolifically on uh, Neanderthals. Um, Prolifically, I, and, and and I was so shocked the other day when I asked um, my dear colleagues to uh, gussy up that paper um, and and wrap it into some slides for this presentation. And uh, on the second slide was um, a, a bunch of Neanderthals. Uh, the 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 relevance of this slide will come into effect at the end. Uh, but it really relates to some of those points that have been touched on today. I think Tim touched on it a bit. We have a bit of a cognitive dissonance about how we approach well-being in general. At the moment, we think about you, right? And when a, a consultant comes into a, a company and says, hey, you know, let's bring your well-being program up to scratch, we've got to think about, you know, the employees at this organisation, those individuals. And I guess our research found some support that... Um, individual-centric uh, approaches to employee well-being are good, but they're missing something, and, and we'll get into that uh, in, in a second. Um, Agla, would you permit me to leave it there for the Neanderthals? Because I really, I could speak for two hours. <laughs> um, my poor MBA students, they, they, they all know about Neanderthals too. Um, so <laughs> we... We did this four-year study. A again, I, I shouldn't be too concerned about naming them. I won't. But um, we were uh, we successfully won a, a, a big award, and it involved working alongside the um, well-being or critical incident management uh, centre of a department of police, fire, emergency management, and ambulance or paramedicine in this jurisdiction. Um, and uh, working also in partnership with the consultants who were brought in to implement a new employee-centric wellbeing tool. Uh, we evaluated it at multiple times, it was six or seven times across the four years, um, and that was a survey-based evaluation. It involved travelling there, it involved countless um, uh, interviews, uh, focus groups, uh, engagement with senior leadership over that period. Um, Yep, that, I think that's good enough. We, we do show a variable at the end about uh, participation with this. We'll, we'll, I'll come to that soon. Now, today we've, we've been talking about mining and we've used this other term, uh, industry, general industry. Um, I think what's important in relation to the legislation, I've got the, the phrase up there that I can never quite recall as far as reasonably practicable. We've, I, Probably you're all better at saying it that than me, but I still find it a bit of a, a tongue twister. Um, when we're talking about emergency services organisations, whether that's a, a fireman um, or whether that's a, a, a person operating in a call centre to uh, give advice to a, a, the person on the phone um, who's, who's dealing with an, an accident um, that they've witnessed or that they're involved with, um, they, these people are exposed to risk. We cannot mitigate the exposure of that risk. We cannot stop that happening. In fact, we pay them to go and do it. We, you know, I would argue we don't pay them anywhere near, near enough to go out and do, do it. Um, but there's no way to stop uh, people being exposed to this. They, they actually actively sign up for it. So what is incumbent is how we um, manage that risk and, and particularly how we manage the impact of that risk. I'm really heartened uh, today, education for police um, starts off with the, the statement that they will all have PTSD at some point. 
uh, that, that at some point there will be points of trigger. And every day that they are exposed without treatment and support, the impact of that will increase. Now, I, I really like this language because if they don't get it, you know, if there's a police officer that goes 30 years through their career and, and don't receive that, that's a plus. But what I hear, the vernacular and the language, is that we must assume that the exposure's there, the risk factors are there, they're going to get it. Uh, and that same could be applied to paramedics, again, um, ambulance and emergency services workers. Um, okay, so what we did in our very final process, I, I, I'll be frank, um, chime in at any point, Hagley. What we were really hoping, what everyone was hoping, when we arrived in, in the state last year uh, to do the final one week evaluation, collect everything, um, meet all of the stakeholders again and go through the process, everyone was hoping uh, that there'd be a year on year rise of employee wellbeing, that everyone would be happy, that you know the effect of COVID would be mitigated, that productivity would be high, um, stress would be low and uh, Yay, well done, money well spent, um, thank God for wellbeing services. Of course, we didn't find, and, and, and maybe if you're tracking wellbeing in your organisation in, in a holistic sense, uh, you might have found this too. It seems that the more we invest, uh, in some ways the worse it gets. Um, it, it, I'm being um, too generalist because there are certainly measures over the four-year period that did increase positively. There are also measures that increased negatively, so there, at times there were higher levels of stress. Um, and there wasn't a consistent trend that, you know, implementation of wellbeing program led to overall collective wellbeing. So, so we'll get into those results a little bit. Um, one of the tools we used to measure was developed by Safe Work Victoria, and it was a measure of workplace trauma. And we thought this was particularly important when we go in and survey police, fire, ambulance um, workers, because the exposure to workplace aggression, trauma, violence is different depending on that jurisdiction or depending on that role or depending on that location. So we needed to account for this in our modelling. So we had this um, tool that captured uh, trauma forming from the work itself, so witnessing a serious accident, exposure to death, suicide and industry, being threatened with a um, weapon, uh, exposure to abuse or being abused, ongoing bullying, workplace incidents, injuries or death. Um, just so you know, we, we also uh, accounted for vicarious trauma for exposure to these because a, a part of our brief was that we, we would be collecting data and at the end of the day we were also responsible for checking how the well-being of the people who work in forensics in police that are, are daily exposed to really horrible uh, images and shocking images, um, how, how those services are also affecting those people. Cool. Your favourite one? Oh, as far as reason, reasonably practicable. I didn't get it. Um, so I, I, I've, I've covered this, but of course, at the end of the day, we were evaluating if that organisation was was doing this. Um, yeah. I think yeah. you're next, Agla. Yes. Finally. <laughs> so, um, obviously, it was a four-year journey, and I'm going to try to take you into this journey building together uh, the model one of the models that we built to try to find ways into our first responders and our emergency services could mitigate the impact, this negative impact of workplace trauma that can't be um, easily avoided. So um, the first thing we checked was if this workplace trauma had an impact on psychological distress, anxiety and depression, and yes, our first responders were showing very high levels of workplace trauma and significant levels um, of psychological distress. Uh, so the first thing that we added into our model was psychosocial safety climate. We wanted to see if the employee's perception on how the organization is prioritizing their well-being um, above other things like productivity and other things um, is helping reduce the negative impact of workplace trauma for our first responders. And yes, the answer is yes, um, it helps. But uh, we found that not to the full extent that we wanted or that we need for these first responders. So um, 
for this particular um, organization that we've been studying, they had in place a well-being intervention that's um, very comprehensive and large. It includes many, many different things. One of those, um, and I could be talking for hours about this, so I'm just going to mention one, is um, a mental and physical well, um, check. So they do mental and physical health checks. Frequently, it's completely voluntary, so they just log in into their website and do the check, um, mental or physical health. If um, you come up with a green light, that's all good, you keep going. Um, if an amber light comes, like a traffic light, uh, you receive a phone call from a professional within eight hours to get some help and some support there. And if a red light appears, they receive a phone call within four hours to address whatever issue, whether it was physical or um, related to mental health issues. Um, that program, as I mentioned, is voluntary. It includes many other things, but this is one of them. And we wanted to see if there was a difference between those, the group of employees that have chosen to participate in the program and those who have decided not to. Um, and, and the answer is yes, there is. Um, they have, they experience the same level um, or similar levels of workplace trauma, but the impact that that has on their psychological distress is different, is significantly different. So we, we saw that those who were participating or actively participating in this well-being intervention were better. Um, now, was that enough? No, we kept searching and searching as we always do. Um, and we included those Netherlands that Ben was mentioning at the beginning, the need to belong, the need to be part of the team, or um, our panel members were mentioning before that maybe the, even that peer support, that being part of a group of the team, of your team. We included that variable, we measured that, and we included that into our model, and um, that was significant. That really, really, really helped um, mitigate the impact of workplace trauma. And I mean really, really because it was a lot more than what the well-being intervention or psychosocial safety climate were doing. So um, probably a lot more needs to be done in terms of team belongingness, peer support, um, like group support and working together as a team instead of just focusing on individual interventions. And this um, is at the stage where we are at the moment. Um, ben is gonna talk about some numbers. So Agla is rolling her eyes because uh, she said, no one's going to understand this slide. And I said, no, no, they'll be right. They'll know. What, what I actually should have said, I know no one's going to understand this slide. It just means I can talk about whatever I want and you'll think that I'm smart because there's numbers on the page. Um, so l let's just uh, zoom out and talk about Neanderthals for a second and then we'll talk about police. So um, uh, in early human... Uh, in early human history, our leadership structures, as far as our archaeology um, informs us, were a lot more egalitarian. Um, basically, if you're a leader, you had to make decisions in the best interest of those that you were leading, because if you led the people that you were leading through a dangerous valley and six got eaten by wolves, everyone would be weaker for that. And indeed, there's evidence um, based off anthropological studies that if leaders make, made decisions that were self-interested or against uh, the, the collective, they would be uh, ex excommunicated or exiled. And in Neanderthal times, the best way to get killed is to be excommunicated because our strength lies in each other. Now, the point here is that in our modern world, where those leadership structures don't exist in that same form, although they still are ideal and indeed many of our genetic um, processes are geared towards small group behaviour, friendships, empathy, relationships, caring, support, even though they're inherent in our genetics, they're not necessarily, uh, th those aspects aren't always recognisable in the management structures of a modern day workplace, right? Probably we'd all agree. Throw the, the context of policing in there, um, and you know you could definitely agree. Throw the context of a resource constrained uh, fire brigade that doesn't have enough resources and has uh, huge fires, you're definitely, you're definitely going to find some of those challenges. So, the, the, the point, with, I guess the key that we found um, here, and I'll get to the numbers in a second, the things with asterisks in, in them on the numbers mean uh, that was a really, really impactful thing. So when uh, people um, had a stronger sense, when these emergency services workers and first responders had a stronger sense of team belongingness, 
the impact between workplace trauma and uh, the resulting um, anxiety and depression feelings was, was significantly curtailed. Um, the the uh, split in the table at the end was uh, are, are those um, that engaged, you can see the yes, no, participation in the wellbeing intervention. So what that means is those people that had a great team and they were working well had a sense that their organisation cared for them and also participated in the wellbeing intervention. Uh, for both the administrative staff and the frontline employees, uh, they, they had a, a significantly lower uh, markers for psychological distress, anxiety and depression. So yes, participation in the wellbeing uh, intervention does help. Those individual things that you might be doing in your workplace, they are making a difference. But the big gap is going back to our uh, Neanderthal or early human or, um, roots and to engage in, in, in collective support and collective behaviour. And the, I guess the, the, the green fields and the blue skies for us as researchers is to look at how we can do more collective-based, um, and Tim was talking about it too, multi-level um, team-based approaches to well-being that complements uh, outcomes. Just one last thing. Um, to know that th this same organisation asked us to do an evaluation of um, a fitness program that they had uh, for the, the same cohort of people. We didn't really know much about fitness. We mostly sit behind desks all day doing statistics. So um, we said yes. Uh, and we found something very similar but, but, but different. So th they were hoping that the fitness program led to people police, fire, ambulance workers being more fit and more ready to you know, run into a burning building and save people. It did that, but that wasn't why it was important. We found that the people who did that program had lower levels of anxiety and depression. And in fact, in that cohort, those people who did that, their anxiety and depression, the distribution of that actually was more similar to the Australian population than those who didn't do the, that, uh, that um, physical activity program, uh, which was actually quite off the scale and, and, and scary. When we interviewed, so the, the stats were there, the program works. When we interviewed people, had nothing to do with going running once a week, as complimentary as that is, or going running in your lunch break with your partners. It was, it was literally a, about going and hanging out with your buddies and going together and going for a run. And again, it goes to show that often these things, are, you know, wellbeing programs are working um, and there might be a social or a team-based element uh, built within them. Um, but we forget about that. Very last uh, thing to note, because it, it also has bearing for, for lots of workplaces. Why this stuff is really important in the context of um, policing particularly, uh, is that all police jurisdictions, uh, because it's so hard to find police at the moment particularly, uh, have reverted to a situation where there's a station, there's teams that rotate through, and the person who is the manager is the manager who's there for that shift. What does that mean? You guys, if I ask who your manager is, you'll say, you know, it's, it's John or it's Susan. But the per in, in police, the person who's their manager is the person who's there that day. And it might be a different person tomorrow. Now, we all know through life, we go through some hard times. Um, we know that, uh, you know, people get pregnant and they need to have complicated conversations about what they're going to do when they take leave. That's, that's an easy thing because there's legislation for that. But there are lots of hard, more subtle, more challenging things that we need to talk about. And unless you have a relationship with your Neanderthal master, um, and unless they have a relationship with you right back, you, you're stuck in a realm of, of, of hard and challenging conversations. I'm noting this because as much as the uh, team belongingness is key, we also have to be uh, knowledgeable about how that team belongingness is being scaffolded um, by leaders. Again, um, harking back to Tim's discussions around a systems uh, uh, approach to designing out um, these psychosocial risks. Agale, I've said far too much. Is there something nice that you can um, wrap up, end on, impress people with? You go for it, <laughs> summarise. Um, so when they asked, they told us that we had 30 minutes to do this presentation and they said, do you want to have Q&A time? I was like, 
oh yes, I want to know more ideas so that we can keep searching um, and finding ways to mitigate this impact. So that's why we have seven and a half minutes. Um, now I'm going to summarize this and then probably plenty of time to ask questions, but I don't promise I'll have the answer. The only thing I learned during my PhD was that one question means a thousand more questions in my head and I don't promise we'll have the answer. So um, in summary, what we've learned with this um, project and this particular paper that we've um, developed is that trauma for first responders, it's part of their role, and as far as they want to uh, mitigate that or needs to be mitigated, um, it's inherent in the job that they do. Um, psychosocial safety climate does, to a degree, reduce the impact of trauma on psychological distress, but it's not sufficient. Um, it still has, um, it keeps that level of psychological distress still up. Then uh, similar levels, uh, similar well-being programs uh, support employee well-being to a certain extent, but their impact is, again, limited. So we want to keep them going, yes, but we need more things, that's the idea. And then the last one, to enable employees to thrive. Organizations should consider increasing their focus on fostering interpersonal relationships at work, that Netherlandal part, uh, such as team belongingness. And that's it from us. Thank you very much. I don't know how, should we, you guys, do you guys want to share that one or maybe you can share this one and I'll jump on there, whatever you like. As you wish. Yeah. Which Whatever's easier. Well, we can go here. Oh, okay. <laughs> you huddle around that one. A um, couple of interesting questions that have come in. Um, you talked a bit about belongingness. In fact, I think that was the final word uh, in your presentation there. Um, this person knows belongingness is important. Um, does this translate outside of the emergency services setting, given that the emergency service sense of camaraderie is often higher than it is in other professions? Uh, yes, easily, and uh, we've, we've tracked it through in other contexts too, and particularly in aged care. Um, just so you know, people don't get paid minimum wage to um, you know, deal with really hard and challenging environments physically and mentally in aged care settings. It's not for minimum wage that they're doing it, it's for each other. Um, that's one context. Nursing, similarly, um, but if, even if you ask yourself, how much are you rocking up to work um, because your mates are there? Um, I, I had a, a, a joke. I took a week of leave uh, last week, and, and Tim wrote to me on Monday. He said, it's hard when you're not here because I can't be in two places in one time. Um, but it harks on two, oh, three weeks ago. He was in the UK for a week, and I thought for the first time, if I can't go and have a coffee with my mate once a week, work just feels like work, and that's boring. Um, and I think, yeah, so ab absolutely. Agla, anything to say? No, do, do you okay. have friends at work that you enjoy oh, yes. to hang out with? Yes. <laughs> and I love going to work just probably because of them and not for the work itself, but to be with them. <laughs> um, My not here. <laughs> there, there are some, Tim, there's some brain pathways that are released. So there, there's dopamine that's released when we achieve something. There's also dopamine that's released in our brain just from hanging out with people that we like. Um, and that's what I was talking about before, about some genetic wiring in humans that make joy just to be around people. Um, we need to tap into this in our wellbeing pro pro uh, programs and not just have kind of target achievement based models for how we deal with wellbeing or even performance at work. We all benefit when we all benefit. So let's, let's focus on the we. I think everyone's high on dopamine at the moment then. <laughs> um, Frontline workplaces, how do they manage the idea that uh, workplace trauma is a rite of passage? I mean, you touched on it there, that you can't take away the exposure, but this sense that it's a rite of passage, the exposure to it. How can uh, a workplace kind of manage that? John, yeah. and we actually had this discussion, I remember we were sitting, um, having a coffee, and we were talking about workplace trauma for first responders, and. Um, is that part of the job? Can that disappear or can that be completely mitigated? And we had this um, big discussion talking about um, the organization obviously needs to do something. It needs to be mitigated, but, but car accidents are still happening. And yes, we can keep doing things, but there's a point of the accidents will happen, things will happen. So these are part of the roles and that can't really be mitigated. So we need to find other ways 
to support them and reduce that level of psychological distress caused by this um, workplace trauma. The, the, and that was Agalay's position, and I said, no, definitely we can, as a hardcore public sector researcher, the purpose of the public service is not to exist, because it's done its job such that all services and people are taken care of. And, and I, I believe in, in a day, and I, I hope to, uh, live in, in a world where we don't have to have the level of violence that we have, um, that the level of accidents that, that are prolific, um, really, in this the level of domestic violence, is dealt with through more effective treatments and programs such that um, either we are all Scandinavian or we just live in a better country. Um, as silly as it sounds, that's the end goal, right? No more bad stuff happens, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Um, how can a business help employees and leaders of employees uh, become trauma informed? One, one of the things we really struggled with with this program was to get anyone to use the uh, individual based tools when they were first launched. We really struggled, we really, really struggled, and they struggled and thought, how could we have paid two million bucks? And every survey we get says, didn't even know it existed, don't know how to access it, my computer doesn't work anyway, what's going on? Um, and similar to, again, I think what Tim was saying is, we asked all of the seniors, so the Director General, we asked them to use it and then to make a video of them using it and the impact of it. And then we asked um, line managers to use it. And, and because they had done it and they had endorsed it and they had lived it and they had been vulnerable and shared that experience publicly, its usage rate increased. Um, it still wasn't, it, I think everyone knew about it, by the time we finished the program, but it still wasn't necessarily widely used um, on a regular basis. Anything to add? Training would be the quickest answer. <laughs> um, I know your research is heavily focused on emergency services and first responders and the like. Um, outside of that though, in the non-emergency services sector, um, if someone is exposed to an assault or some kind of aggression, um, can the resulting trauma f from that in fact be more pronounced? I think my, my honest sense is that when anyone's exposed to any uh, serious trauma, it doesn't matter where they are, including if they're in emergency services, it's not easy. And, you know, PTSD can form from... The, the, a trigger for PTSD for you might be different uh, from that for me, and it might be different for that to, you know, Cole Blanche, the, the Director General of Police, or, or, or anyone, or um, our Premier, or, you know, anyone in this room. And, and so it's not... We need to just be mindful of this all of the time, that no one is weak if they have PTSD, that no one... Um, it's, it's not their fault that these things are, and uh, that's a natural response to seeing something quite unnatural unfold uh, in front of you and that warrants empathy um, and support and compassion whether you are in any role, um, whether you're a millionaire or a pauper. One final question. I think I'm taking a liberty here asking a final one because I think the time is up. But uh, I think this is relevant, uh, particularly uh, post-COVID when we've got people who want to continue working remotely or working from home and not coming back into the office. And just going back to your point about belongingness, um, someone has asked the question, is remote work undermining the psychological benefits of that team belongingness? Can I do a plug? I just published a, an article <laughs> called um, uh, Flexible Work Divided Workplaces. Uh, it's, it's just, it's on LinkedIn. Um, you can look it up. But, um, uh, but it talks about that. It, it, um, Tim and I and, and, and Marcus as well did a huge research project uh, with the Centre of Work Health and Safety in New South Wales, part of Safe Work, um, during COVID, but on flexible work. And it was looking at belongingness and how, how you in, envisage it and, and how you bring it into being. And the truth is, it's simple. Uh, you do it. So you spend the time, you, you build relational capability into your leaders, into your people, and you expect them to deploy that. Um, that you have the, the Zoom meetings uh, where you just have a cup of tea, you have some, um, some time knowing each other um, as well as doing work. So you can't avoid that. You have to build it into your, your work as it is in a face-to-face -face office where you have natural interaction. It has to be bought in purposefully in the online environment. Okay. On your LinkedIn page, we can find it there. Very good. Thank you very much. Would you please thank uh, Ben and Aglay. 
uh, from ECU. Thank you so much.